If you are joining us for the first time in this webinar series, uh, my name is Haley Ruman. I'm the Professional Development Manager, and I also have Devin with me. I'm Devin Crawford, um, and I'm the Instructional Coach at CLA. So this webinar series is focused all around summer school and how you can leverage your Smart Lab HQ program to enhance the summer school experience for your students this summer. This webinar specifically, we're gonna be talking about literacy and how to integrate literacy um, into the Smart Lab experience. Our previous webinars, um, we've talked about math, We've talked about uh, different ways to integrate the Smart Lab to support summer school and just some general practices that you can incorporate in any learning space, whether you use the Smart Lab HQ itself or not. So if you've missed any of those, you can find them on our launch pad. We'll um, talk about how to access those resources towards the end of the webinar today. All right, so today we're gonna talk about three uh, main topics, how to integrate literacy um, into the Smart Lab, um, specifically around kind of summer slide and some of the effects uh, that COVID has had on learning in the past year and a half. We're going to talk about our Smart Lab learning process, that five step framework for student led project based learning, and how to integrate literacy throughout each step at the primary grade band, elementary and middle school grade bands. And then last, we're gonna talk specifically about read alouds and how you can pull those into your um, everyday Smart Lab experience to create a literacy rich environment um, and to pull in some of those more specific uh, Common Core State Standards, ELA standards. So we're gonna talk about some projects um, that you can specifically choose to help support some of that work. All right, so um, specifically about integrating literacy, one of the best things about literacy is that it is all around us, uh, whether it's from reading signs to reading menus, um, just writing in every day for work, for pleasure, uh, just for functioning as a human being. Um, so that is one of the great parts about literacy is it's really easy to integrate. Uh, it's also one of the interesting things about some of the data we're getting back now um, about the effect of COVID and learning loss that that seems to be a little bit less for literacy. Um, and some of that is pointing towards the fact that reading, writing, speaking is all around us. Um, and it is integral in, you know, almost everything we do. Uh, throughout our days and our weeks. So um, we are going to talk a little bit about summer slide. Uh, we shared some of this data in our one of our previous webinars um, that some data pointed to the fact that students in grades second to ninth grade lost up to 30% of the learning um, that they gained throughout the year. And that is um, a little bit higher in students of color. Um, another interesting thing is that according to the NWA, WEA, which is a research-based nonprofit, they create growth-based assessments for schools to use. Um, they found that students who experience learning loss in one summer are more likely to experience learning loss or learning loss in following summers. So it's really important to give students um, access and that they're continuing to practice both what they learned um, in, during the school year, but specifically with literacy. Reading, summer reading programs are always huge. Um, definitely a big initiative for a lot of schools. So uh, the Colorado Department of Education uh, published some information about summer slide and some of the big barriers that can impact learning loss, specifically around literacy skills. Um, is having access to books, uh, students' perception of reading and um, how that's supported or not supported in the adults, with the adults in their lives. Um, whether they read, whether they have positive perceptions about reading and just how frequently or um, how integrated reading is into their routines, um, into their day uh, at home. So 
providing access to books is huge. Encouraging reading is very big. And that of course can be integrated into a summer school and a summer smart lab experience. So a couple strategies to help mitigate learning loss um, is leveraging your local public library. If you have access to books within the smart lab, um, but maybe it's not accessible to get it out to all your students so they can take it home. Uh, maybe you provide a list of books that are related to the topics they're working on in the smart lab and they can go get it from their local public library. I'm sure you might even be able to get a local librarian to come talk to your students that are in your summer school and maybe give them some resources on how to set up a library card, how to find books, how they can check them out that kind of thing, just so that they know that's a resource. And if they are really interested in something that's going on in the Smart Lab, they can go above and beyond, go get additional books and learn even more about that topic um, in their free time at home. And that's a great thing to encourage. Another important piece is uh, providing students with choice in what they're reading. In the Smart Lab, that could look like uh, integrating books to support you know, creating a comic with Comic Life or creating their own book in Pixie and allowing them to choose the topics uh, and then be able to choose the books that they're interested in or maybe use one of their uh, favorite fiction books to be the inspiration for a project. Providing choice we know increases engagement and motivation um, so that can be really helpful to leverage their interests to get them into reading. Also, just take advantage of the opportunities where you see literacy being used in every day. Um, you know, Smart Lab is all about leveraging curiosity and prompting students to ask questions frequently. And one way to answer questions is by reading books. Um, we know that collaboration is huge. So also practicing speaking skills, speaking clearly, audibly, expressing their ideas, asking clarifying questions really easy uh, skills to bring in to the smart lab and practice. You could also send some suggestions home with your students so they can continue some of those conversations um, or even activities at home to extend the learning. Another strategy to try is using com community experts. If you can bring someone in who has an expertise or a career in something you're working on, Say you're working with robotics and you've got a local robotics engineer who can come talk um, about that topic, answer students' questions. They're really practicing those listening and speaking skills. How do I appropriately talk to an adult? What vocabulary do I use? Especially if they are um, partway through their project, they have already learned some vocabulary. So pushing your students to use that industry vocabulary um, that is going to be common between a professional and what they're learning. And of course, practice listening. Um, if they've got experts and they're trying to gather information to inform their project, jotting those down, uh, maybe providing some templates to help them organize their notes can also be helpful. And of course, uh, incorporating an authentic audience. Uh, if you build your summers, your smart lab experience into summer school or summer camp, it's great to have an opportunity for them to show off what they learned throughout that experience uh, by bringing in parents, other staff members, siblings, students in the school. Uh, you can do kind of like a show and tell, gallery walk type experience uh, where students are standing near their projects or their presentations and then uh, speaking and obviously practicing those skills uh, to share important information about their experience. So those are a couple strategies um, just to enhance literacy in that experience so that we're really trying to mitigate summer slide um, and recoup some of that learning loss that students may have experienced in the last year and a half. All right, now we're gonna move into integrating literacy throughout the Smart Lab learning process. Um, Devin's gonna review for us um, just the steps in that process. So we kind of went over this multiple, multiple times, but um, really thinking about how we can use literacy in each step of our smart lab learning process is kind of what we're going to deep dive into. Um, something to note is that 
thinking through how much time, which we've said on the last webinars, how much time you actually have to plan um, really meaningful moments. If you're finding, you know, you don't get a lot of opportunity to actually work with the gen ed teacher and you're doing a lot of the planning and integrating, um, maybe that integration looks more like just inserting a read aloud. Um, but we'll talk more about read alouds and how, you, you know, you should use best practices of like stopping and thinking and asking questions. Um, one thing that I know one of my old teacher friends used to bring up is that she thought the engineering design process was very similar to the writing process. So if you're thinking about how do I kind of share this with my gen ed or ELA teacher um, and get them to use this cycle, um, they kind of think of it as like explore might be how do I plan and get ideas. Um, and then you may draft in the plan and do section, then you may edit in the reflect, you know, section, and then you publish and share. So there's definitely ways to naturally integrate writing um, if you don't have a lot of opportunities to kind of do it throughout your smart lab already. Um, the other piece of good news is that we actually do a lot of reading, uh, speaking, listening throughout all of our project starters. Um, and it's just a matter of what opportunities do you want to highlight and what piece of evidence do you want to collect um, during each step. So we'll kind of talk more specifically about how we integrate those literacy concepts. But like I said, I think that they already fit really naturally um, to kind of practice, improve, and demonstrate the literacy skills. Think about them actually presenting um, their ideas. That's a lot of listening and speaking skills. When you're launching a lesson, you may think of opportunities for them to collaborate and they have to listen to each other. They have to use language, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer language. So though we will go over ways that you can insert more, um, also think about the ideas of how do I want to collect the evidence? Uh, is it really just me taking formative assessment? Um, do I just want them to have more opportunities to read or do I want to give this information or data that I'm collecting to someone else, then you should be really purposeful in how you're collecting it. Um, so yeah, we'll go into explore and Haley will tell you more about how that might look in a literacy setting. So in the explore phase, um, and you know, thinking about the Smart Lab experience and what students do in explore, this is an opportunity for students to build curiosity, to access prior knowledge, um, start building project ideas, as they explore the tool, whether that's a kit or a software program that they're using for that project. So really low risk, low stress, um, all about exploration and asking questions. And so I'm gonna go through each grade band and ways that you can pull in um, these major clusters of literacy standards from the Common Core State Standards. And you'll notice that a lot of these are very similar across the grade levels, but they build on each other. So you'd want to look a little bit more um, into the standards and make sure that specifically how you're implementing this is matching the grade level expectations. Um, but I pulled those overarching kind of themes um, and we'll talk about each of those grade bands. So in primary, um, having students generate questions during and after exploration of a smart lab kit or software program um, is really great. And then to piggyback off of that, provide books that are related uh, to the topic, whether that's because you guys are doing Kid Connects Insects, and so you add books about insects, um, or maybe you're using something like Pixie and you're retelling stories, and so students get to pick a book, um, their favorite story maybe that they wanna retell. Just make sure that they're at appropriate reading level that your students can access uh, you could also incorporate a read aloud here and then prompt your learners to ask and answer questions about the text and how it specifically relates to their project. So starting to gather some information that's going to help them. Also, writing informative um, and explanatory texts. Students are doing a lot of learning just through their exploration. So having them document that in an informative way, um, you know, I'm exploring this kit and thinking about insects. This is what I figured out. This is what I think I can build. 
uh, just putting that documentation piece in. Recalling information and experiences to answer questions uh, fits really naturally as learners are asking questions about the tool or about their projects. So then being able to sit together as a class and gather uh, their background knowledge that they already know about that topic, what they've experienced before, specifically with tools, uh, pulling information from experiences is really helpful because many of them may have used a similar tool. If it's Kid Connects, they may have used Legos. And so maybe they, but they uh, connect together in a similar way. And so that's a really great opportunity um, just to focus in on that piece. At the elementary level, uh, using technology is a really big part of the Smart Lab and most of our elementary learners in third through fifth grade are documenting in Google Slides or Seesaw or a similar program. Um, so this is a great way for them to begin that documentation by jotting down the questions that they've answered or that they have, um, the responses to those questions, what they've learned through their exploration, and even adding some pictures to show evidence of what they were able to build or what they figured out. So using technology um, is another big literacy standard and can easily be pulled into the Smart Lab experience. After exploring and documenting, ask your learners to share what they learned um, and have them build on each other's responses and clarify each other's ideas. So that collaborative discussion piece is a really big uh, listening and speaking skill. And so pulling together probably at the end of your time in the Smart Lab uh, when you're doing exploration can be really helpful. You'll have students figure out different aspects of the tool and then be able to start connecting some of those, asking questions to further understand if it's something that was confusing to them. So that's a great opportunity for practice. And then of course, um, you know, incorporating some books related to the project or topic is great. You can incorporate a relevant read aloud and then prompt your learners to jot down information that answers questions that they had or it might be helpful as they begin working on their project. So if you um, have students either write questions in their journals, or maybe you guys jot questions down as a class that they have during or at the beginning of exploration, then pulling in a book to support answering some of those other questions can be really helpful. At the middle school level, um, have middle schoolers also document their learning with a digital journal or an online portfolio. A lot of our middle school students use, again, either Google Slides, if that's um, still kind of new or accessible or most appropriate to them. A lot of them start building websites. And so that's a great digital tool um, and portfolio to start building and constantly add to. Create opportunities for them to collaborate as they document, whether that's just with their partner and collaborating or by sharing their portfolio with a peer and asking them for feedback. Um, or just those natural opportunities of, oh, you had that question, I put that in my journal, I published that on my website um, last project cycle. Go ahead and here's the link and you can access it. Uh, check it out and let me know if you have any questions. So other ways for uh, learners to collaborate together using, those, using that technology. As learners explore, as middle school learners explore, push them to ask, why is this happening? How does it work? What does this mean? Where could I learn more about this? To ignite their curiosity and establish a authentic purpose for research. Encourage learners to access a wide range of resources, whether the, that's instructional manuals, videos, books, websites, and of course, the what you should know information from the project starters. And have them use those resources to answer their questions and ensure that they're documenting that and organizing that in their journal or in their portfolio. Learners may benefit from having um, some note-taking templates or mind maps uh, that help them organize their research because that is also a big part of uh, research standards for middle school learners. And after explore, we move into plan. Yeah, so as we know already from using this same learning process for all of our projects, 
Uh, we often see the planning phase as the time when they're writing their SMART goal um, and also kind of thinking through um, how am I going to be assessed from my facilitator, but also like a self-assessment. What are the things that I want to be able to accomplish? How will I know when I got there? Um, I'm just more of like the project management side. Um, and so we'll talk about the three different areas where you may integrate literacy. Like I said, I feel like it's already something they're going to be doing anyway. If you think about what they're doing for a SMART goal, they're writing it down, which is essentially working on their writing. Um, and you know, it may look different at a primary level versus elementary versus middle school. Um, I think the importance is, is kind of like guiding them through, setting them up for success, but kind of like a gradual release of how am I going to give them the tools that they can use to write their own SMART goal or plan of action? And then how am I going to ensure that they continue writing without me there, without supports? Um, so primary specifically, um, you know, you will see the heavier support in that grade level. So if they're, especially if they're not independently reading or writing yet, that might be something that you do together as a class. Um, if you have a document camera, I think it's more important that you're modeling the actual writing of each letter. Um, so if you're doing it under the document camera or if you have a really strong writer in the class, it might be a good idea to have them come write it under there. If they have the, you know, the confidence to come up there, just seeing another student write kind of in this similar handwriting that they have. Sometimes they see teacher handwriting. I actually was told this the other day. They were like, wow, your handwriting's really messy. And I was told that I had the best handwriting ever. <laughs> So I think kids just don't really see Henry that looks like theirs, but um, just giving them a chance to really document their SMART goal, um, making sure that's in a central lo location. So we're gonna say like in their journal, uh, that's usually where it is. So it's not just, I'm writing it out on the board. I would definitely give them a chance to write it themselves. Um, and if you're doing it as a class, I think it's important to participate in like a planning out loud or a think out loud process. Um, and so maybe I don't know, I'm thinking about a specific student I had in first grade who was consistently struggling with uh, sounding out words. And so I would model, even though I knew how to spell, um, how I would spell out words. You know, if I'm thinking about, you know, I don't know how to spell learn, I may sound out the word learn and write it out and kind of model that practice for them. Um, kind of like a nice way of gently pushing them in the right direction. Um, and then we have elementary. So we kind of give them more independence during this. Um, you know, when they're looking at their initial plan, you may think about asking them in to incorporate some contingency plans. You know, what if something doesn't go wrong or something doesn't go right and you have to plan for this? Um, kind of what are you expecting to do? And they can kind of connect ideal scenarios and contingencies. Um, and then after learners write their SMART goal, think about how they're going to outline the initial plan, which is not something we really see as much in primary. This is more detail oriented. It's really going to get them to write more, think about the questions more. Um, and then you're giving a chance for either their partners or their group members or their classmates to give them feedback. Um, especially those who create plans that you're like, wow, this is not something we can complete in a full project cycle. Um, kind of thinking through what's more reasonable or how do I kind of create something that's more bite-sized. Um, I think if you're finding there's certain students that need extra assistance in this, a good way to scaffold is uh, just create one period at a time a goal versus a whole project goal. So if they're having you know, some difficulties with seeing the big idea. Maybe you're just saying, what do you want to accomplish by the end of just this um, period? And then, you know, they can work towards a larger goal. Um, in middle school, you know, after they've developed their SMART goal and they have their initial plan, um, they really, similar to elementary, they're gonna think about the steps that they need to complete the goal. Um, and I think, providing an opportunity to learn, to have the learners kind of receive the feedback similar to elementary, um, just giving them really strong feedback protocols and procedures. Um, this is something that we 
hope that teachers are really engaging in, but maybe that looks like you're going to model for them or you have two students come up and model. What does it look like to give, you know, evaluative feedback based on their SMART goal? Um, what does it look like to pose those questions? And then they can actually do it on their own. So that way they're really feeling like the environment safe for them to share and give that feedback. Um, and then really pushing them to use specific vocabulary in middle school. We know that's really big on understanding what they're doing for the project. So maybe you present them ahead of time. All of our project starters we already have in the what you should know section that vocabulary, but maybe you want to add extra vocabulary in there because you know that's something that they're learning in ELA or writing. Um, and then kind of thinking about what other reading could you incorporate in their plan. So if you're looking at that what you should know section, Maybe you can find extra books that they can look at um, or narrow some of the resources if there's too many, kind of based on the goal. I think especially in middle school, there's an area where students really need to understand the importance of what makes a good resource. So thinking about if I'm giving them a bunch of books and they're learning about the different types of rock, maybe giving them multiple perspectives on that. Um, so that they can think about, I know that this is one side of it, this is another, and then I have my own. Um, I'm really trying to separate my point of view from the author's point of view. That's like a fifth and sixth grade standard as well. So them being able to speak up, use their resources to make their own point of view um, will definitely help them as they're planning out you know, what it is that I want to do in my SMART goal. I would say Google it like Googling is a huge skill and being able to look at a list of resources and say, you know, this looks legit and reliable and this does not. Um, that could be a huge skill and is a really good one to practice before they are out independently doing that without any support. Um, so even that, making that accessible. I know a lot of schools have like a set of research resources through their library. Um, so that might be one to talk to your librarian to see what's available as well. So moving into the do step of the five step framework. So this is where students are actively working on their projects. They are working to meet their SMART goal and executing the steps in their plan or modifying their steps, revising their goal um, as needed. So in the primary le level, um, some of the ways that you can incorporate literacy in a more explicit way um, is by using a catch and release model. So ask a guiding question, um, discuss it as a group, have that collaborative discussion, send them off to test or try something or complete a portion of their project. Maybe that's something that you guys decided as a group was a good next step. Bring them back together to discuss what they accomplished and how it worked. And then use this as an op opportunity for shared writing. Um, for your youngest learners who are not independently writing at all, this might just be modeling and either having them help supply words that you write up on the board, on an anchor chart, um, under a document camera. Maybe they're drawing pictures to match the steps of what you guys did and what you found, what the results were. And then as learners work with their partner on their project, encourage them to ask questions when they get stuck or need information. And facilitators, um, they're really great at responding with, quest with questions and kind of guidance instead of answers. So even though you're not going to be supplying answers, um, just supporting your learners with being able to ask specific questions when they need help, when they need resources so that you can point them in the right direction. Uh, that's a really great skill, not just for literacy, but also as an essential skill, being able to get help and ask specifically what you need. Um, that is also really important. Um, all right, and then at the elementary level, uh, when students are documenting their process, because they should be documenting what they're doing, what they're learning, uh, what their results are, if they had challenges, jotting down uh, how they approach those and what the outcomes were, prompt them to use really precise, rich vocabulary, especially that vocabulary that relates to the topic. Um, I've always found that learners will 
they will vocalize something, but they don't know the word for it yet. So that's a really great opportunity to introduce them to the word. You know, they may say, well, my circuit, it all has to be connected. Yeah, it's gonna be a closed circuit, no gaps. That's called a closed circuit. And then prompting them to incorporate that into their writing because it's more specific. Um, and that's the, you know, technical vocabulary uh, that relates to that. To reinforce that, you can also help make career connections and incorporate the vocabulary that those professionals use to explain those concepts. So if an electrician came to their house and they were trying to explain what's wrong, they can actually incorporate some of the, that vocabulary um, to improve the understanding and communication between them. Prompt learners to make connections as well between ideas and information in their texts and how it relates back to their project. Um, that's a pretty high level skill. So it's great to practice with the text, things that they're learning in different parts of it, you know, in that informational text. Um, and then how does that support their project? Might be explaining how something worked or maybe even how they figured out uh, a solution or uh, another strategy to try, or maybe that's how they figured out the root cause of the issue they were encountering. At the middle school level, um, learners draw conclusions as they explore and as they test things out about the way their technology or project works. Um, circuitry is a really great example because there is so much trial and error of, okay, let me put this together and see what happens. Let me change something and see what happens. And based on the results, I'm gonna come to a conclusion about like why that happened. So then prompting your learners to use informational text to back it up, um, find those reliable sources, and then cite that as evidence in their journals or in their portfolios. And of course, presenting those um, as they're sharing, whether that's later in the smart lab learning process, or if that's the end of the day, you know, one, one challenge that I encountered and how I overcame it was this, and I know that this works because of the evidence that I found in this book, or this is how I understand how it works now. And after students complete their project, and also just frequently throughout the process, they reflect. As learners work, and especially after they've completed their project, it's important to give them a time, an opportunity to reflect uh, both on their progress, but also just on that uh, learning experience as a whole and um, thinking about what was my goal in the beginning? Did I meet it? Why or why not? Um, what did I know at the beginning? What do I know now? How did that change? And at the primary level, um, some of the ways that that could look is having learners reflect on their project. Um, and prompt them to use, to add illustrations and visuals. That's a writing uh, standard at the primary level, um, just to add additional detail that they may not be able to perfectly, um, you know, put into their writing in great detail, but they can have that diagram or that illustration to refer back to. You can also use an essential question to guide the focus of the project. Introduce it at the beginning in the explore phase or when they first start their project and then ask them to follow up at the end and answer that question. And that can again be uh, orally in kind of a morning meeting style where students go around and they share their thoughts and build on each other's ideas or whether that's actually written or by filming a video and responding um, and asking them to, you know, share why, um, you know, their experience include their experiences from the project to support that. At the elementary level, um, as learners reflect on their project and what they learned along the way, ask them to gather information from their experiences in the project, you know, in the do it phase, um, as well as from text sources to provide that background information and that evidence to really support what they're saying. That's just great in general so that if they are coming to maybe some inaccurate conclusions based on data that they have or uh, you know if there was an error in their trial and they have wrong data then they can compare that to evidence from text um, and do some reflection on why maybe that doesn't match up 
And then give them an opportunity to share that with their peers for feedback. Whether that's focused on writing and here are my grade level writing expectations of, um, you know, these specific ones, you can incorporate that in their journal, give it to them on a bookmark, uh, whatever your elementary teachers already do. And they could respond based on that and make suggestions for improvements in their journal or even just the content, you know, really focus on that revision piece. Uh, and then give them time to actually revise and edit their journal before they go into uh, the share phase, really focusing on making sure that they're explaining thoroughly and being clear so that when they share, um, others will understand them well. At the middle school level, ask your middle school learners to look back through their journal and identify relationships between events and steps that they took throughout their project and how they're connected. Ask them to revise their descriptions to clearly connect those ideas from one day to the other or from one project step to the, ne to the next. Um, you know, how did this inform this next piece or this is what we figured out. And so then we decided to complete this next step. Um, really kind of pulling in that logical flow and emphasizing that. Ask learners then to create a concluding statement to summarize what they learned or to evaluate whether they achieved their SMART goal and why or why not, um, and maybe setting some goals moving forward. You can supply some reflection questions to help guide that summary, um, but it's really about synthesizing that experience and uh, pulling together what they learned from that project. Love a share. My slides were frozen before. So I was like, <laughs> oh, I don't know what slide we're on. <laughs> and I was like trying to get back to it. Um, but yeah, so in the share phase, um, we really think about students focusing on the process, um, not just the end project. More importantly, you know, being really aware of how they learn something and being aware of how do they learn it best. Um, and so thinking about how certain levels are trying to share information, it may look more scaffolded, less scaffolded, but the most important part is that they're actually presenting their product to an authentic audience. Um, so maybe at the primary level, you're thinking about how am I going to integrate books into this share process? So you've given them a book and you've asked them, how has this book helped you with your project? Um, or ask them, you know, share something about the book or the topic, um, kind of pointing out those important details. I think one of the, like a certain situation that I'm thinking of that I think primary and elementary school students really struggle with is the retail part. They really don't always think about what are the main parts of a story. They just want to tell you the entire story. So I often have to tell them, you know, I can't go see a movie. Could you just give me the cliff, cliff notes version of the movie? And really thinking about what are those important parts? You know, well, who was in the story? What was the setting? What was the problem solution? And maybe, you know, what was the lesson learned? So that might be an area where you scaffold of how can I give you some sort of rubric? Uh, this is how you're going to discuss it, but then using an essential skill of how do I present in a uh, stronger way. So maybe I'm thinking about the volume that I wanna use. You don't want kids holding up a book or a paper up to their face and then you can't hear them. So you're modeling for them, this is how it looks. Um, then you give them a chance to actually practice it and then really picking out important details and not just reading us the whole story. Um, and then at an elementary level, this is similar in the sense that you can tie in books to think about, you know, how is that book helpful in supporting your understanding? But maybe you're allowing them more choice as to they can then pick another book um, that they can share about the main idea. Third grade starts a very difficult topic of finding the main idea of a text. And if they are given multiple opportunities, they will ultimately become stronger readers, but also be able to point out the main idea quickly with those key details, um, thinking about how did those key details kind of help you as you learned? And then 
like we said at the primary level, also focusing on the essential skill of how do I practice presenting um, and thinking about what are the facts that I want to include. Maybe you give the audience a rubric that you want them to use to kind of give them feedback. Um, and then it gives them also a thinking job. I think too often we have people present and we don't give the audience a thinking job. So if I'm a student that has a thinking job, I know what I'm looking for and I'm actively engaged in what, you know, what we're, we're listening to. Um, and then they get to practice that skill of kind of giving feedback. Um, and then at the middle school level, you know, at the conclusion of the project, we know that they're going to be completing some sort of portfolio presentation. Um, more importantly, when you think about portfolios, I think in the professional sense, you don't put every single piece of work or every single piece of evidence in your portfolio. So maybe this is kind of an opportunity to think about who is the audience that I'm presenting to and what would be the most important information. Um, you know, they shouldn't just be copying and pasting text throughout the entire presentation. Maybe they switch it up with graphics or music. Um, and then thinking about what pieces or artifacts would best represent their ideas and their thinking um, and just giving them an opportunity to revise based on some of that feedback. Once again, authentic audience, you know, real, real people that they're presenting to. And if you have the opportunity to pull in someone through you know, Zoom, and it's actually someone that they can present to that is relatable to their project, um, it will definitely give them more purpose and you will see them be extremely engaged um, when they feel like what they're doing matters and who they're presenting to is definitely going to be listening. Um, yeah. And if you have the opportunity, it might be, it would be really powerful to have your summer school teachers uh, be present in the smart lab as students are working on this project to embed instruction real time as students are utilizing these skills or encountering challenges. Um, you could even do kind of a mini lesson and then go into the smart lab and that's the practice piece um, and be able to go do conferring with students, uh, leave them with some strategies to try and kind of make your rounds um, a lot like a readers and writers workshop if you're familiar with that model or if that's a model that your school uses for reading and writing instruction. Uh, if you don't have that opportunity, you might be able to just get some reading or writing strategies. A lot of teachers, I know I always had um, strategy bookmarks, especially you know, it's a little more at the elementary level, uh, maybe also at the middle school level, but that your learners can bring into the Smart Lab with them as a resource of if I get stuck with figuring out this word, I've got this bookmark of strategies that can help me. Um, and then that would take a little bit of the load off of the facilitator needing to provide that reading and writing instruction um, if that's not their area of expertise. So depending on how available your summer school teachers are, whether there's the opportunity to bring them in, um, that could look a little bit different, uh, but if they're not able to, maybe just looking, seeking them out for some resources to reinforce especially if you know what literacy skills you're gonna focus on with that project or with that day, uh, they might be able to give you more specific strategies to try that they're actually working on um, at that time or in the last couple days in summer school. So now we're just gonna talk a little bit about um, using read alouds, which are Kind of an easy way to integrate some of that literacy um, kind of into each stage. There's definitely a way that you can put it in, you know, any type of book. It doesn't matter the age of students. I promise they love stories being read to them. So it doesn't matter if they're at a primary level or middle school. Um, kids just naturally really like when you read to them. I do think that if you don't have a storyteller voice, um, there's definitely people that do on YouTube and Storyline Online is also another good one because if you're not gonna read with expression, you're actually not modeling for them what good readers do. Um, and just thinking through, even if it's a video or whatever you choose to do in the way that you read some of these books, um, thinking through how are you going to make this more of like an active read aloud. It's not just they're listening to the facilitator read, but they're 
they're actually engaging in conversations with one another. Um, maybe they're possibly turning and telling a partner about what they think or a question that you've asked them, um, or maybe just quickly jotting something down, giving them a chance to actually write about what they're reading, um, or maybe through like a think, pair, share. Just being really, really strategic about kind of how you want to incorporate a specific goal in an ELA standard. Um, and I'm thinking about where am I going to stop and have kids think about this question? Where am I going to model for them what it looks like? Kind of think of an example of maybe I'm kind of reading a book and I need students to think about, you know, how do, how do I make an inference? So if, I, if kids need to kind of know how to make an inference, maybe I'm reading a book and I see an area where I think it will fit really nicely. I put a post-it there and I do a, a think aloud and I think about, you know, I know that based on the text, this is what it told me. And based on my past experience, I know this. So I can infer, fill in the blank. And, you know, that's maybe the first stop that I have for them to make an inference. The next stop may be I give them a sentence frame and they actually try it themselves, depending on the grade level. But we'll go into kind of more detail of those integration strategies, but just being really strategic of how you're integrating them, but also like when you want to incorporate some of those stop and jot or stop and think um, kind of opportunities for them. Um, and so these are, you know, kind of the ways that we thought about how would it look at each area or step um, along the way of incorporating that read aloud. I think that there's a lot of different ways that it can look, um, but these are just some of the ideas that you can use. So we thought about the launch. Maybe you kind of begin a discussion around an essential skill and engage in a follow-up discussion at the end of the day or project, um, or begin a discussion around an essential question and then focus on the application of the Smart Lab Kit. So an example of either one of those, maybe it looks like I am reading a book to launch the essential skill of problem solving. And I talk about how the character and the story did some problem solving. Um, great, now when you go off and do your work, we're gonna think about how did you problem solve just like the main character in the story. Um, and then that evidence could look like discussion responses, um, just formal observations of, you know, when they're turning and talking to a partner um, and how they're answering that essential question. Um, and then during the explore phase, this may be more of like an entry event. Um, so you're really trying to hook them, you're trying to get them interested in something. Um, or maybe you're just presenting them with a problem that they're going to solve by completing the project. And doing this is essentially giving them that context or the purpose for the challenge. So depending on if you're giving them literature or an um, information text, you're really thinking about what, what type of context or what type of role are they going to be playing in the project. So maybe they're solving a fictitious problem. They're reading a story and it's really giving them, you know, I think about the three little pigs and they're like, okay, so they need to create a house using Induno that cannot be blown down by a wolf. Um, though this is not something that would happen in real life, it happened in the story and they're thinking about how they're connecting to it versus if I was reading an information or a nonfiction text, Maybe I'm actually thinking about a real problem within my community. Um, it just gives them a chance to kind of re-engage some of that background knowledge um, and gives you, as the facilitator, a, a way in to think about what do they already know about this subject and what is something that they're interested in learning about the subject. And then at the end, what is how is that going to change based on what they've learned? Um, and then during the plan phase, maybe they're answering questions and gathering some more information. So maybe that read aloud comes at like a mid, mid class workshop where we're like, oh, we're going to read this book about um, whatever they're working on. Maybe it was Bridges and they're going to read more information about Bridges. And then they can actually think about 
how can I revise my plan based on what I just learned, some of that new information, or maybe it's just strictly around creating that SMART goal. Um, and so some of that evidence might be, you know, as they're hearing this new story, they could think about what am I going to do to my SMART goal or how can this change my idea of the constraints on the project? So maybe they just learned that the type of bridge that they're making does not fit well with the amount of traffic that's going over the bridge because we know that that type of structure doesn't hold up based on what we just read. So they're really thinking about what are the revisions I could make um, kind of based on this new information. And then there's the do and reflect section um, and they may be answering questions to the how and why something works the way it does. Um, it provides them information with background knowledge, gives them a chance to use the text and reflect and revise. So similar to plan where, you know, you could read the story at the beginning and they then are sent off to plan or you can do it mid class where they're kind of given a chance to be like, oh, I just read this new information. Now I think differently. Um, it just kind of depends what you see as their time to plan. So is it, you know, they're going to write their SMART goal based on that story that we just read, or is it they're going to write their SMART goal and I'm walking around and I'm like, these SMART goals are really off. You know, they really don't feel like they understand the subject that well. I'm going to go find a book. I read them the book and now they want to revise, reflect, um, kind of on how, how their project is going or the way they need to change it to better make sense. Um, and then of course the extension part, this is like for me the least invasive way to incorporate read alouds. You can be like, oh wow, you were really interested in a topic. Let's read another book on this topic and see this done as like something they can do independently or um, as a class discussion. So maybe independently, one of your students finishes early. It's a great opportunity to be like, oh, I found this really great book that's on the project you just did. You know, if you want, you could read more about it. Great. Now they have an extra piece of literature that they're reading. Um, and maybe that evidence of reading kind of comes in as they respond. You ask them a question that they can respond to in their journal or Maybe it's a time where they read a book um, after they've done a project and they think about, you know, the validity of a resource. Like, is this a, now that I've already read some resources and I've already done my project, this really has me thinking a different way. Um, and that's something that they're going to need to know in life. Is this a really good resource or, you know, maybe this is really one-sided and the author's point of view is just very different than what I read before. Um, Haley, I don't know if you want to add anything because I went pretty fast over them. So you're on mute. <laughs> if anyone has Zoom bingo, check one off. Um, <laughs> no, I think like these are really natural ways to pull it in. Like Devin said, reading, do it, engaging in read alouds. Like it takes stress off of learners really I loved it because it always pulled my class back in and built that community of learners um, among us where we had some kind of shared text and experience. And so it's really nice to have that common understanding, um, common experience that you can build off, uh, even in just that simple way. So I think you covered, uh, you covered a lot of it. Um, and Devin's also gonna chat about some resources that we've developed uh, to help even more with that. Yeah, so this is kind of a guide to integrating the read alouds in Smart Lab. And so we we're trying to think about three different things. The first thing is there are a lot of literacy standards. So after revising and thinking through what are the ways that we can integrate them, we decided to pull three different standards for each grade. And the three different standards are one uh, literature standard, one nonfiction standard, and then one writing standard for each separate grade. Um, and then we thought through, how are you going to integrate this during what part of the process? So maybe this is really, this fits really nicely in the launch. Maybe this fits really nicely in the explore. And so that will be in the guide as well as um, the essential question that goes along with the standard. 
Um, and then a book that we think goes really well with it. So I know when I was thinking about some of these books, I thought about, you know, do we really want students to think about fiction or nonfiction book? Uh, if I'm thinking about a fiction book, maybe I'm thinking about character change is really important. So thinking about the essential skill that the character goes through. Um, and that would be really important for them to really think about, but also maybe that um, character also does something similar to the project that they're about to engage in. So I think that some of these books are really, really, actually all of these book selections, because we selected them, <laughs> are really great. But I also know that um, I was in a public school that did not have access to a very large library. Um, and so there are ways to go around it. YouTube has a, a lot of read alouds. What I would suggest is that you listen to it entirely before you present it to your second grade class. Um, Cause I've definitely had a mistake where I didn't listen to it and you know, just didn't go as well. Um, and then the other opportunity would be, you could go on to Storyline Online. And if you haven't heard of it, um, celebrities reading books. And like I said, if you're not a storyteller, you don't have the storyteller voice, this is a great way to get someone else to tell the story, but also it's fun and exciting because it's a celebrity reading a book. Um, and so if there's not, if you don't have that specific book, those are just some options. Um, but yeah, these are definitely really helpful resources and how do I integrate those read alouds? How do I make it bring the joy of reading into your smart lab? Because the more opportunities you give them to hear reading and to practice those literacy skills, um, just the more opportunities they're going to get to actually strengthen their ability to read and write. Um, I think there's there's definitely a lot of information, probably more than you need in the guide. Yeah, and I would definitely encourage you to check out your local libraries as well, your public library. Um, my library when I taught had a specific like teacher library card and my book limit was increased so I could I could get the read alouds I needed, but if I also needed supplemental text for research or for projects, I could get a large amount of them. Um, and I could even keep them longer if it was a long term project. So check it out, see what your library offers. Um, your librarians might also have some good recommendations for, you know, if this book isn't available that we've recommended, what is a good alternate that either meet, reaches the same goal or is on a similar topic. Um, so definitely, definitely check those out. Um, and one other thing that we've put in this guide is an essential question for each of those projects that is focused around that literacy standard. So you can introduce that at the beginning, either of the book or the project, and kind of chat about that throughout. That could be a great kind of ending discussion of each day. Of, hey, let's check in. Have we learned anything new? Have we tried anything different? Um, how is it going? And then you know follow up at the end as well kind of a a nice big overarching guiding question there's also um, a number of project starters on the smart lab launch pad that are already aligned with common core state standards so if you go onto the launch pad log in with your admin login go up to that welcome message and select standards use that left side um, fill in Common Core or your state standards, the grade level and language arts. Um, and it will show you a list of project starters that are, are already aligned. And so you might point students uh, towards those, but that's also a good resource to try and find um, just some project starters that naturally connect really well in addition to the ones that we are providing in that other guide. Um, we'll be posting the recording for this webinar and the resources we've talked about on the Smart Lab Launchpad. You can get to that page with this QR code or by following the steps um, over on the left, going to the facilitator resources, scrolling down to other resources, and then finding the Smart Lab HQ and Summer School page. And we'll continue to update that. We've got um, one more webinar next week that is focusing on driving inquiry with essential questions. So after um, that webinar, we'll upload the final recording and resources, and then that page will have everything you need to support your summer school 
with your Smart Lab HQ program. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, we'll keep an eye on it for the next minute or so. You can also raise your hand and we can unmute you if you want to ask a question, if that's easier. Uh, you can also reach out to us, you know, if, as you take time to process and to look through the resources and maybe talk with your summer school staff and figure out um, how you best want to integrate literacy into your Smart Lab HQ program. Feel free to reach out to us at academics at clsonline.com. That'll get both Devin and I and the additional members of our academic services team. And we'll make sure the right person gets back to you um, so that we can support you in your summer school. You can also call um, in one of the menu options as academics and they'll get to one of us. Um, I also put my contact information there just in case you wanna reach out directly. Feel free to reach out and thank you guys so much for joining us today.